In Paris, not far from the Pont Neuf, stood the establishment of Boma and Bassange, the most celebrated jewelers of their day. After triumphs which had given them worldwide fame during the reign of Louis XV and made them fabulously rich, they determined, with the advent of Louis XVI, to eclipse all their former efforts and crown the professional glory of their lives. Their correspondents in every chief jewel market of the world were summoned to aid their enterprise, and in the course of some two or three years, they succeeded in collecting the finest and most remarkable diamonds that could be procured in the whole world of commerce. The next idea was to combine all these superb fragments in one grand ornament to grace the form of beauty. A necklace was the article fixed upon, and the best experience and most delicate taste that Europe could boast were expended on the design. Each and every diamond was specially set and faced in such manner as to reveal its excellence to the utmost advantage, and all were arranged together in the style best calculated to harmonize their united effect. Form, shape, and the minutest shades of color were studied, and the result, after many attempts and many failures, and the anxious labor of many months, was the most exquisite triumph that the genius of the lapidary and the goldsmith could conceive. The whole necklace consisted of three triple rows of diamonds, or nine rows in all, containing 800 faultless gems. The triple rows fell away from each in the most graceful and flexible curves over each side of the breast and each shoulder of the wearer. The curves starting from the throat whence a magnificent pendant, depending from a single knot of diamonds, each as large as a hazelnut, hung down halfway upon the bosom in the design of a cross and crown surrounded by the lilies of the royal house, the lilies themselves dangling on stems which were strung with smaller jewels. Rich clusters and festoons spread from the loop over each shoulder, and the central loop on the back of the neck was joined in a pattern of emblematic magnificence corresponding with that in front. It was in 1782 that this grand work was finally completed, and the happy owners gloated with delight over a monument of skill as matchless in its way as the pyramids themselves. But alas, the necklace might as well have been constructed of the common boulders piled in those same pyramids as of the finest jewels of the mine, for all the good it seemed destined to bring the poor jewelers beyond the rapture of beholding it and calling it theirs. The necklace was worth 1,500,000 francs, and it seems that Messrs. Boomer and Bassange had not entirely paid for it yet. They had 10 creditors on the diamonds in different countries and an immense capital still locked up in their other jewelry. The first thought, of course, that kindled in the breasts of Boomer and Bassange was that the only proper resting place for their matchless bauble was the snowy neck of the Queen Marie Antoinette, then the admired and beloved of all. Her peerless beauty alone could live in the glow of such supernal splendor, and the French throne was the only one in Christendom that could sustain such glittering weight. Louis XVI, in spite of his odd notions upon economy and just administration, easily listened to the delicate insinuations of his court jewelers, and one fine morning laid the necklace before the queen. Her Majesty, for a moment yielded to the promptings of weakness and danced and laughed with the glee of an overjoyed child in the new sunshine of those burning, sparkling, dazzling gems. Once and once only, she placed it on her neck and breast, and probably the world has never before or since seen such a countenance in such a setting. It was almost the head of an angel shining in the glory of the spheres, but a better thought prevailed, and quickly removing it, she, with a wave of her beautiful hand, declined the gift and besought the king to apply the sum to any other purpose that would be useful or honorable to France. We want ships of war more than we do necklaces, said she. The king was really delighted at this act of the queen's and the incident soon becoming widely known gave the latter immense popularity for at least 24 hours after it occurred. In fact, the amount was really applied to the construction of a grand line of battleship called the Soufren after the great admiral of that name. Boma, who seems to have been the business manager of the jeweler firm, found his necklace as troublesome as the cobbler did the elephant he won in a raffle and tried so perseveringly to induce the queen to buy it that he became a real torment. She seems to have thought him a little cracked on the subject, and one day when he obtained a private audience, he besought her either to buy the necklace or to let him go and drown himself in the Seine. Out of all patience, the queen intimated that he would have been wiser to secure a customer to begin with, 
that she would not buy, that if he chose to throw himself into the Seine, it would be entirely on his own responsibility, and that, as for the necklace, he had better pick it to pieces and sell it. For some months after this, the court jewellers busied themselves in peddling their necklace about among the courts of Europe. But none of these concerns found it convenient just then to pay out $360,000 for a concatenation of 800 diamonds, and still the sparkling elephant remained on the jeweller's hands. Time passed on. Madame Campan, one of the Queen's ladies, met Boma one day, and the necklace was alluded to. What is the state of affairs about the necklace? asked the lady. Highly satisfactory. I have sold it to the Sultan at Constantinople for his favorite Sultana. This the lady thought rather curious, but she was glad the thing was disposed of and said no more. Time passed on again. In the beginning of August 1785, Boma took the trouble to call on Madame Campan at her country house, somewhat to her surprise. Has the Queen given you no message for me? he inquired. No, said the lady. What message should she give? An answer to my note, said the jeweler. Madame remembered a note which the Queen had received from Boma a little while before, along with some ornaments sent by his hands to her as a present from the King. It congratulated her on having the finest diamonds in Europe and hoped she would remember him. The Queen could make nothing of it and destroyed it. Madame Campan therefore replied, There is no answer. The Queen burned the note. She does not even understand what you meant by writing that note. This statement very quickly elicited from the now startled German a story which astounded the lady. He said the Queen owed him the first installment of the money for the diamond necklace that she had bought it after all, that the story about the Sultana was a lie told by her directions to hide the fact since the Queen meant to pay by installments and did not wish the purchase known. And Boima said she had employed the Cardinal de Rohan to buy the necklace for her and it had been delivered to him for her and by him to her. Now the Queen, as Madame Campan knew very well, had always strongly disliked this Cardinal. He had even been kept from attending at court in consequence, and she had not so much as spoken to him for years. And so Madame Campan told Boma, and further she told him he had been imposed upon. No, said the man of sparklers decisively, it is you who are deceived. She is decidedly friendly to the Cardinal. I have myself the documents with her own signature authorizing the transaction, for I have had to let the bankers see them in order to get a little time on my own payments. Here was a monstrous mystification for the Lady of Honor, who told Boma to instantly go and see his official superior, the chief of the king's household. She herself being very soon afterwards summoned to the queen's presence, the affair came up, and she told the queen all she knew about it. Marie Antoinette was profoundly distressed by the evident existence of a great scandal and swindle with which she was plainly to be mixed up through the forged signatures to the documents which Boma had been relying on. Now for the Cardinal. Louis de Rohan, a scion of the great house of Rohan, one of the proudest of France, was descended of the blood royal of Brittany, was a handsome, proud, dissolute, foolish, credulous, unprincipled noble, now almost 50 years old, a thorough rake, of large revenues but deeply in debt. He was peer of France, Archbishop of Strasbourg, commander of the Order of the Holy Ghost, said to be the most wealthy in Europe, and a cardinal. He had been ambassador at Vienna a little after Marie Antoinette was married to the Dauphin, and while there had taken advantage of his official station to do a tremendous quantity of smuggling. This she never forgave him, and accordingly, when he presented himself at Paris soon after she became queen, he received a curt repulse and an intimation that he had better return to Strasbourg. De Rohan was just silly enough to feel this infliction most intensely. He went, however, and from that time onward, for year after year, lived the life of a persevering Adam thrust out of his paradise, hanging about the gate and trying all possible ways to sneak in again. Once, for instance, he had induced the porter at the Palace of the Trianon to let him get inside the grounds during an illumination and was recognized by the glow of his cardinal's red stockings from under his cloak. But he was only laughed at for his pains. The porter was turned off and the poor, silly, miserable cardinal remained out in the cold. Lastly is to be mentioned Jeanne de Saint-Rémy, Countess de la Motte de Valois de France, the chief scoundrel of the necklace affair. She seems to have been really a descendant of the royal house of Valois, 
to which Francis I belonged. Through an illegitimate son of Henry II created Count de Saint-Rémy, the family had run down and become poor and rascally, one of Jeanne's immediate ancestors having practiced counterfeiting for a living. She herself was receiving a small pension from the court of about $325 a year, had married a certain tall soldier named Lamotte, had come to Paris and was living in poverty in a garret, hovering about as it were for a chance to better her circumstances. She was a quick-witted, bright-eyed, brazen-faced hussy, not beautiful, but with lively, pretty ways and indeed somewhat fascinating. Everybody at Paris knew about the diamond necklace and about de Rohan's desire to get into court favor. This sharp-witted female swindler now came in to frame necklace, jeweler, cardinal, queen and swindler all together into her plot, just as the keystone drops into an arch and locks it up tight. This is what she saw all at once. Boma is crazy to sell his necklace. De Rohan is crazy after the Queen's favour. I am crazy after money. Now, if I can make de Rohan think that the Queen wants the necklace and will become his friend in return for his helping her to it, if I can make him think I am her agent to him, then I can steal the diamonds in their transit. The Countess began to hint to the Cardinal that she was fast getting into the Queen's good graces by virtue of being a capital gossip and storyteller and that she had frequent private audiences. Soon, she added intimations that the Queen was far from being really so displeased with the Cardinal, as he supposed. At this, the old fool bit instantly and showed the keenest emotions of hope and delight. On a further suggestion, he presently drew up a letter or memoir, humbly and plaintively stating his case, which the Countess undertook to put into the Queen's hands. It was the first of over 200 notes from him, notes of abasement, beseeching argument, expostulation and so on, all entrusted to Jean. Next, Jean talked about the Queen's charities and on one occasion told how much the amiable Marie Antoinette longed to expend certain sums for benevolent purposes if she only had them, but she was out of funds and the King was so close about money. The poor Cardinal bit again. If the Queen would only allow him the honor to furnish the little amount, the Countess evidently hadn't thought of that. She reflected, hesitated. The Cardinal urged. She consented and was so kind as to carry the cash herself. At their next meeting, she reported that the Queen was delighted, telling a very nice story about it. The Cardinal would only be too happy to do so again, and sure enough he did, and quite a number of times too. The Cardinal is at Strasbourg, when he receives a note from the Countess that brings him back again as quick as post horses can carry him. It says that there is something very important, very secret, very delicate that the Queen wants his help about. He is overflowing with zeal. What is it? Only let him know his life, his purse, his soul are at the service of his Liege Lady. His purse is all that is needed. With infinite shyness and circumspection, the Countess gradually, half unwillingly, lets him find out that it is the diamond necklace that the Queen wants. By diabolical ingenuities of talk, she leads de Rohan to the full conviction that if he secures the Queen that necklace, he will thenceforward bask in all the sunshine of court favor that she can show or control. A last and sublime summit of impudent pretension is reached by a secret interview, which the Queen says the Countess desires to grant to her beloved servant, the Cardinal. This suggestion was rendered practicable by one of those mere coincidences which are found though rarely in history and which are too improbable to put into a novel, the casual discovery of a young woman of loose character who looked much like the Queen. Gay de Lever was hired and taught, and with immense precautions, this ostrich of a cardinal was one night introduced into the gardens of the Trianon and shown a little nook among the thickets where a stately female in the similitude of the Queen received him with soft-spoken words of kindly greeting allowed him to kneel and kiss a fair and shapely hand and showed no particular timidity of any kind. Yet the interview had scarcely more than begun before steps were heard. Someone is coming, exclaimed the lady. It is Monsieur and Madame d'Artois. We must part. Farewell. And away they went, Mademoiselle d'Oliva, to report to her employers and the Cardinal in a seventh heaven of ineffable tomfoolery to his hotel. Bohemer and Bassange were only too happy to bargain with the great and wealthy church and state dignitary, a memorandum of terms and time of payment was drawn up and was submitted to the Queen. That is, swindling Jeanne carried it off and brought it back. 
with an entry made by Villette de Reteau in the margin, thus a bonbon, approuvé, Marie-Antoinette de France. The payment was to be by installments, the Queen to furnish the money to the Cardinal, while he remained ostensibly holden to the jewellers, she thus keeping out of sight. So the jewels were handed over to the Cardinal de Rohan. He took them one evening in great state to the lodgings of the Countess, where with all imaginable formality there came a knock at the door, and when it was open a tall valet entered who said solemnly, on the part of the Queen, Villette de Reto, calmly receiving the 1,500,000 franc treasure, marched out as solemnly as he had come in. As that counterfeiting rascal goes out of the door, the diamond necklace itself disappears from our knowledge. The swindle was consummated, but there is no whisper of the disposition of the spoils. But that is not the last of the rest of the parties to the affair by any means. Between this scene and the time when the anxious Bomer, having a little bill to meet, beset Madame Campin about his letter and the money the Queen was to pay him, there intervened six months. During that time, Countess Jean was smoothing as well as she could, with endless lies and contrivances, the troubles of the perplexed Cardinal, who couldn't seem to see that he was much better off in spite of his loyal performance of his part of the bargain. But this application by Bomer and the enormous swindle which it was instantly evident had been perpetrated on somebody or other, of course, waked up a commotion at once. The Baron de Breteuil, a deadly enemy of de Rohan, got hold of it all, and in his overpowering eagerness to ruin his foe, quickly rendered the matter so public that it was out of the question to hush it up. It seems probable that Jeanne de la Motte expected that the business would be kept quiet for the sake of the Queen, and that thus any very severe or public punishments would be avoided, and perhaps no inquiries made. It is clear that this would have been the best plan, but de Breteuil's officiousness prevented it, and there was nothing for it but legal measures. De Rohan was arrested and put in the Bastille, having barely been able to send a message in German to his hotel to a trusty secretary, who instantly destroyed all the papers relating to the affair. Jeanne was also imprisoned, and Miss Gay d'Oliva and Villette de Reteau, being caught at Brussels and Amsterdam, were in like manner secured. The result of the trials that followed was that the cardinal, appearing to be only fool, not knave, was acquitted. Gay d'Oliva appeared to have known nothing except that she was to play a part, and she had been told that the Queen wanted her to do so, so she was let go. Villette was banished for life. Lamotte, the Countess husband, had escaped to England and was condemned to the galleys in his absence, which didn't hurt him much. But Jeanne was sentenced to be whipped, branded on the shoulder with the letter V for Volus, thief, and banished. This sentence was executed in full, but with great difficulty. For the woman turned perfectly furious on the public scaffold, flew at the hangman like a tiger, bit pieces out of his hands, shrieked, cursed, rolled on the floor, kicked, squirmed and jumped, until they held her by brute force, tore down her dress and the red-hot iron going aside as she struggled, plunged full into her snowy white breast, planting there indelibly the horrible black V while she yelled like a fiend under the torment of the smoking brand. She fled away to England, lived there some time in dissolute courses, and is said to have died in consequence of falling out of a window when drunk. The unfortunate queen never entirely escaped some shadow of disrepute from the necklace business, for to the very last, both on the trial and afterwards, so sore and morbid was the condition of the public mind in France in those days, when symptoms of the coming revolution were breaking out on every side, that this odious story found many unwilling believers.